Amen. We appreciate the worship team. You all can be seated. If you don't care to take out the outline uh, that's in the center of your bulletin today as we look to the word of the Lord together this morning. The joke is told about a lady who was sitting in a McDonald's and she was getting ready to enjoy her meal. And she couldn't help but notice an elderly couple across the restaurant from her. And she got to watching them. And she noticed uh, something peculiar that even though there were two of them at the table, the old man and old woman only had one meal. And she watched as the elderly man took the hamburger and he, he divided it in half and he took out a napkin and spread it and gave half to his wife and he kept half. And then he, he got the fries out and he divided them out pretty much 50-50 and gave her half on her napkin and he had half and then took the drink and he had an extra cup and he poured half of it into one cup and gave it to her and he had the other cup. Well, this woman was moved, and she thought, that's, that's pitiful. They, they must be uh, in tough times. They can only afford one meal. And she said, I'm, I'm going to pay it forward. I'm going to go over there and help them. So she went over and introduced herself. She said, you don't know me, but I couldn't help but notice that you've only got one meal, and I'd like to buy you all another meal if that's okay. And the elderly man said, oh, honey, said, that's okay. He said, we could afford another meal. He said, but my wife and I made a rule when we first got married he said, everything from the beginning has been divided 50-50 right down the middle. And he said, uh, we're just dividing this meal like we always have. And she said, okay. And she said, well, I noticed that your, your wife is, is eating, but you're just sitting and, and watching. Why aren't you eating? He said, well, it's her turn with the teeth first. Um, <laughs> that was better than last week. Come on. Better. Um, today we are talking about material things and so I thought that might be a good place to fit that one in today if you have your Bible turn with me to Luke chapter 12 and we'll start with verse 13 Luke chapter 12 uh, verse 13 in today's text the love of money uh, came to lead to a conflict in a family and and we read in verses 13 and 14 says then someone called from the crowd Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Now, according to the law of that day, the elder brother was entitled, the firstborn was entitled to two-thirds of the estate, and the younger brother would just get a third or however many portions were left. They got the biggest portion. So we're not sure the specifics of this conflict um, if he was not given his younger brother the third or if he was the younger brother I don't know how it was all working but there was a dispute and maybe some of you can relate to sibling rivalry maybe you've got young ones now and you know that they compete over everything or maybe you are grown adults and, and you can attest to sibling rivalry uh, today but my advice to you just you know I'm not going to focus on this part of the text today but my advice along these lines would be this Always value people and relationships over stuff. Okay? Always value people and relationships. So what if they get a little bit more than maybe what you feel like they're entitled to? But at the end of our life, it's the people, it's our family, it's the love relationships that will matter the most. And don't sacrifice that over things. And so Jesus made it known that he wasn't interested in playing the role of, of arbitrator between these two brothers. Uh, but perhaps he sensed something, though. He sensed that in this situation, the root of the problem seemed to be greed. And so he takes this opportunity to talk to them and to everyone listening that, that, that day about the topic of, of greed. And, and the root cause of this conflict was greed. And in Luke 12, 15, it says, Then he said, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Now, in today's text, Jesus warned his listeners about the dangers of greed. And I think the first place we start today is that greed uh, is a sin. Okay? The Bible says that greed is a form of idolatry. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. In subtle ways that we often don't realize, stuff and the love of material things it just kind of creeps in we don't consciously choose it it just kind of weaves its way into our life and many times we don't realize that we maybe overvalue stuff 
and undervalue other things in life. Most of us like to think we don't have a problem with greed. Maybe you're thinking of people that you hope are hearing this message, that they have problems with greed. But it goes back to what I shared last week, that the two big indicators of whether we might have a problem with stuff is how we spend our time and how we spend our money. Those are truth tellers about our real priorities. So with that thought in mind again, let's look further. Material wealth, the Bible says, has a tendency to distract us from our spiritual need. You know, Jesus talked a lot about money. Uh, Jesus knew the huge distraction that material things could be. Revelation chapter 3, he's speaking to one of the churches, and he describes the problem of this church. And he says, you say I am rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I've read accounts that say that when missionaries are are trying to share the gospel, they find a greater receptivity to the gospel overseas in what we would consider third world or developing nations. There's a greater uh, receptivity to the gospel in those places than there are right here in the streets of America. And on the flip side of that, it seems to be true that the more we have, the, the more uninterested we are in spiritual things. How many times have we seen celebrities seem to change their whole values when they suddenly hit fame and and money and fortune and all the things that go with that, then they change drastically in who they are after all that stuff comes into their lives. We typically don't think of ourselves as rich, but I've shared before, you've probably heard it, but if you live in the United States, you pretty much are in the top 10% at least of wealth worldwide just by living in this country. Jesus commented on how material wealth makes it so much harder to stay focused on what truly matters in life when he said this in Matthew 19. I'll say it again. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you think about that today, that's, that's all of us as, as Americans. We are blessed to live in this land of plenty that, that we live in. And a lot of people seem to fear poverty today, but Jesus is saying, really, if you boil it down, what we ought to be more afraid of is wealth because of what it can do to us spiritually. Well, he, as Jesus often would do, he, he tells them a story to illustrate the point about greed that he was trying to make. And so the story starts in verse 16. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops, and he said to himself, What should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Now, this man, it's important to note, he already had more than he needed, okay? And so things are going so well that his biggest problem is that he doesn't have room enough to put all of his blessings. And, And we might be able to relate to that, again, as Americans, when we see that we've got all this stuff and nowhere to put it, and so we, we pay to rent storage buildings. I, I read this week that over 10% of American households are renting a storage unit, so they have a place to put all their stuff. And that's not an indictment on storage units, you know, but, but that's saying something that we, sometimes we fill our garages where we're supposed to put our cars with, with all this stuff, so we put our cars outside, right? Because we've got to have somewhere to put our stuff. And this man says, I'm so blessed, uh, I don't have anywhere to put it all. So the desire for wealth has led many people to compromise their integrity and to take foolish risks that can cause them harm. 1 Timothy 6, 9 speaks to this. It says, but people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. Have you ever thought, you know, if I just had a little more money, I wouldn't have some of the worries I have right now. You know, if I just could, could bump my income up to this level or if I could, could just get a, a surprise amount of income so I could pay off this, this deal, this situation and, and could get out of this jam, I wouldn't have as many worries. Then I would be sailing smooth. But often the truth is, and some of you who've got a little wisdom know have found this to be true, often more money and more stuff brings more worries and more problems. <laughs> And it just are different problems with dollar signs attached to them. Perhaps you've heard of the the many stories of people who've won the lottery. And uh, I think there was a show on TV, The Lottery Ruined My Life. Is that a show or did I just dream that? 
And all these stories of people that, that thought, man, if I could just win the lottery, that would solve all my problems. But it created problems uh, in their lives. Here's just one story I came across uh, this week. One man lost $16.2 million and ended up a $1 million in debt after one year. Uh, a former girlfriend successfully sued him for a third of his winnings. Uh, his own brother allegedly hired a hitman to kill him, hoping to inherit a share of the winnings. After putting money into a business, he sank into debt. And uh, he served time in jail for firing a gun over a bill collector's head. Uh, he said, I wish it never happened. It was totally a nightmare. I was much happier when I was broke, he said. And he eventually, according to the story I read, lived on $450 a month uh, until his death. And so maybe he was happier that way than he was with all the money. It's an illusion to think if I had more money, I'd have fewer problems. The man that's the story in the story that Jesus told had come up with a plan. I don't have place enough to keep all the blessings I have. So he said, I know, in verse 18. Then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now, take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. See, the problem, though, was that this man's plan was all about him. It was all about more stuff. And there's no indication that he gave any thought to how he could, first of all, acknowledge God as the source of all of his blessing. I just, as I read the story, tend to think this man started to think he was just that clever. That he had everything in life going his way. And, and notice the language that he uses in this verse where he says, My crops, my barns, my wheat... And a proper perspective on material goods begins with the fact that it all belongs to God. It's all His. We've just got it on loan for a while. One of the words that the Bible uses to describe us and how we relate to money is that we are stewards. A steward is somebody that just manages something for somebody else. And that's the way that God looks at it. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. What we have is on loan from God. We get to manage it for a while. We get to make some decisions with it for a while. But the day will come when it will no longer be ours and we will breathe our last and then someone else will manage it for a while. And they'll move it around and make decisions with it and then their time will be up and someone else will move it around. That's the, the hard facts of life. It's all God's. We just take turns managing it. We don't give God the tithe, we return the tithe to God. I, I, I was reminded of this principle when my boys were younger, and I can remember sitting in a restaurant after we had gotten the meal, and my boys' french fries looked good, right? And so I, I hadn't, I'd ordered something different, and so I just reached over to get uh, a fry or two maybe, you know, and I got my hand swatted. <laughs> Y'all ever do that? And the thought went through my head, if I want to eat one of them, if I want to eat 10 of those fries, I will. Because guess what? I paid for the whole meal right here. Sucker, you had not had a job yet, right? It's all mine. And you're telling me I can't have a fry, right? Now, maybe you've had a similar struggle with, with, with your kids. But I think that sometimes God must feel that way when we say, I don't know about this tithing stuff, God. I, I don't know, you know, I, I, I just, I, I'll, give, I'll see what's left, Right? And, and, and we, we look at it and God says, it's all mine. You're not giving me anything. You're returning a portion to me. There's no indication that this man in this story gave any thought to how he could pass on any of the blessings to other people. There's no thought process of saying, you know what? I've got enough. I've got everything I need more. How could I bless somebody else? Not a part of his process, his thought process. Listen, it's inconsistent with Christianity to hoard your wealth and to only spend it on yourself. 1 John chapter 3, verse 17 says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, but yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? You know, another principle the Bible teaches us about worldly things is that a desire for more can keep you and rob you of the ability to enjoy what you already have. It robs us of contentment. You know, a, 
a number of years ago, I can remember uh, Dana and I were new parents, um, and we were living in a different county, and, and I, I don't remember what show I'd watched, but there was something on TV about this guy um, that he was falsely accused of something, and they sent him to prison. And so he served a number of years. I forget how, how long he was in there, but a long time he was in prison, away from his wife, away from his children, and it was a great injustice, but then eventually the truth came out, and uh, he was turned loose from prison. And so he got to go back to his wife. He got to go back to his children who had now, he'd missed many years of their life. But I remember seeing in that story how grateful he was to get back to where he started from. It wasn't like he'd won the lottery. He just got back what was taken away from him, but he looked at life completely differently. And that lesson stayed with me. I thought about that over and over, and I can remember... I'm not a, a person that, that's a, I wouldn't call myself a songwriter by any stretch, but that thought stayed with me, and I just turned it over my head, and I remember years ago, for whatever reason, just having this little tune come to me, and I sing it still to myself sometimes today. I want to share it with you today, and maybe it'll be a reminder to you as well, but I look at the world differently now after watching that silly movie about this guy, but it goes like this. Tell me how to live for to live that way is what my best friend said to me. Susan drives a brand new Chevrolet and she bought Mike a new TV. While I've been saving up for weeks just to buy a pair of shoes. Well, Ted and Louise got back last week from a Caribbean cruise. Now, sometimes don't it make you mad? How we're barely getting by. But I just looked at him and I shook my head. And with a wink of an eye, I said, I am a rich man for all the good things in my life. For if you took away all I have today, my two boys and my wife, and then somehow I got them back again, oh, how thankful I would be. For the things that I already have are the things that mean the most to me. He's, <laughs> he said, well, yeah, I guess I see your point. It's all in how you look at things. There's so much more to this world than fancy cars and diamond rings. It's not in having what you want in life. It comes from wanting what you have. If you've got the Lord above and someone that you love, well, then you're on the right path. So I say I am a rich man for all the good things in my life. For if you took away all I have today, my two boys and my wife, and then somehow I got them back again, oh, how thankful I would be. For the things that I already have are the things that mean the most to me. And you know what? That's what greed robs us of. Of a healthy perspective on life called contentment. And greed, this desire that says, that says, if I just had a little bit more, if I could just get to this, if I could just achieve this, then I'll finally be happy. But God is saying to us today, my child, I want you to be happy today. You have everything that you need. You know, I encourage you to be, be generous with those who are in need. And, and here's the, the question that I, I've asked myself and I ask all of us today. What if we had to put a dollar amount? How much money would it take for you to be happy? And maybe some of you uh, could honestly say, in the honesty of your heart, Greg, I have everything already today. I don't need for anything more. I've got everything I need. I'm happy right now. And I believe that. I believe that. But maybe there's somebody here today that's fallen into this cycle of just chasing uh, the dog, chasing its tail, and you'll never get there of thinking, if I just had this, if I just could get over this hump, if I could just get to this point in my life, then I'll finally be happy. What's that dollar amount for you? What kind of possession, what kind of achievement are you waiting on? You know, if we shift the focus today, and that's what I want to do for a remainder of our time, and instead of building bigger barns, 
Let's talk today about taking what we have and building blessings in our life and in the lives of others. The first key to building blessings is to honor God with the first fruits, the Bible says. The story's told of a father who gave his little girl two dollars. And he said, now honey, he said, one dollar is yours to spend however you want. He said, but the other dollar belongs to God. He was trying to teach her about tithing and giving God the first fruits. So the little girl had her two dollars and she said, thank you, daddy. And she took off running down the street. She was headed straight to the candy store. But as she was running, she tripped and she lost control of her money. And one of the dollars went down the storm grade. And so she, she got up, she dusted herself off, and she said, sorry, God, there went your dollar. <laughs> and sometimes I think we may look at it the same. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 through 10 says this, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. God is not as interested in our money. God doesn't need our money. He, he is the God that owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't need that. But God wants us to give him first fruits because he knows that money is the biggest competitor for our heart. Things. And so he's saying, hey, trust me with the first fruits. Will you put your money where your mouth is, so to speak? Do you trust me as your provider or is it really up to you when it's all said and done? It's a completely different perspective. And I just ask you to ask yourself this morning, does God get the first fruits of what he's blessed you with or does he get leftovers? I came across a question recently this week as I was preparing for this message. And, and I thought, man, I never thought of it that way. But I thought it was interesting. It says, if God took your offerings and he multiplied them by 10 and made that your salary, would your lifestyle change? <laughs> it's interesting to think of it that way. So I encourage you, whatever that, that amount is that you give cheerfully, not under compulsion, the Bible says, but that we say, God, you are my provider. And so I put you at the top of my budget, not at the bottom after miscellaneous. Secondly, if you want to build blessings instead of bigger barns, be generous with those in need. Luke chapter 12 goes on in verse 33. It says, sell your possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. Now, I don't believe that this passage is saying, hey, if you want to be a real Christian, you've got to live at the poverty level. And if you have anything, if you ever go on a vacation, if you ever do anything to enjoy life at all, then you're sinning. That's, that's not what this is saying. God is a father who loves to bless his children. He loves to see us enjoy life. What he doesn't love is to see us spend everything on ourselves. He doesn't want us to be reservoir, reservoirs. He wants us to be conduits, channels of blessing to others. And so in, 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 as you spend and prioritize the money that you're blessed with, also leave room and say, you know what, Here's, I want to take a portion of it and bless other people along the way. I want to honor God and I want to bless some other people along the way. When you give to those who have less than you, you're making an eternal investment. You know, if the stock market went bad, some of you might lose some money. If, if the banks all uh, got in trouble, maybe you might lose some money. But what you pay forward into eternity cannot be lost. And it cannot be taken from you. You're investing your time and your resources in something that will long outlive you. Thirdly, invest in things that are eternal. 1 Timothy chapter 6 says, Teach those who are rich in this world. And remember, as Americans, that's basically all of us. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need. Always ready to share with others. By doing this, they'll be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. You know, when you boil life down to the bare essentials, what our remaining time here on this earth is, is most about is to glorify God. And how do we glorify God? Through worship, but listen, also sharing the good news of the gospel, advancing his kingdom. And when you get to the end of your life, what do you want to be said about you? Here's one thing that I bet you don't want to be said about you. Boy, he, he, he used all of his resources and he lived life to the fullest. I don't want that to be said of me. 
I want it to be said that he blessed other people, that he gave his, his time away. He gave to others and helped them when they were in need, and he gave himself away. You know, I feel good about the money that I give here to this church. And I'm in a position where I can see many times the fruit of what happens to that. And uh, this is in no way trying to manipulate you. You know, we're doing fine with the budget and all that. Don't read anything into this that I'm not saying. But I feel good about giving to the ministry of this church because I see the lives that are changed. I see the difference that it makes. And sometimes there are differences made I don't even know about. But when I'm gone from this earth and somebody else is moving around the resources that I have, I believe that the investments we make in the kingdom will long outlive us. What are you planning to leave behind when you leave this earth? Will the resources God let you manage for a while still be making a difference when you're gone? You know, another thing that I believe wholeheartedly is that our acts of kindness and generosity can open doors for the gospel. You know, one of the things that we could be accused of, and I'm sure we probably are, is that we spend a lot of money on having meals and feeding people. Or we spend a lot of money on things that we give away to people uh, here in this community and beyond. And people will say, well, well, Greg, you know, you ought to be spending that on the gospel. And I look at it that we are. Because anytime we have a meal and people in our community gather to receive that meal, guess what they're also going to get? They're going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're going to hear about him. And so if it takes a meal to gather people, but it also might fill somebody's belly that wouldn't have had a good meal otherwise. But we're also gathering a crowd to proclaim about eternal life and invest in their eternity. So we don't apologize for that. You know, acts of love and generosity and kindness in your life can build a trust and a credibility with you and someone else in your life, in your workplace or in your neighborhood, whatever it might be, that they care more because they know that you care. They care more about the message that you have to share. So use the resources you have to bless people and gain a hearing for the gospel. Let me, before I close, talk about the greatest investment of all. In verses 20 and 21, it says, But God said to him, he's talking about the man and his story he told, You fool, you will die this very night, and then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Now, he didn't call the man a fool because he, he built up wealth. Okay, I, I, Greg's not preaching today that if you got above a certain amount of money, you're a sinner and there's no way you can go to heaven. That's not what I'm saying. He was a fool because wealth had him. And it was all about him. At the moment of his death, none of this man's wealth or accomplishments were worth a dime. The only thing that matters when we breathe our last is what we did with Jesus Christ. And so maybe you're here today and life's going okay for you right now. You've got plenty of money in the bank and, and your job is, is as secure as anybody's job could be with everything that's going on in the world. And you feel pretty good about your place in life. But let me ask you the most important question. How are things with you and Jesus Christ? Have you ever asked him to come into your heart and to be the Lord of your life, of everything in your life? Is the Holy Spirit your daily companion in all of your thoughts and your decisions and your priorities? Are you living for his glory? Mark chapter 8, verse 36, it says, And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? Don't be distracted by the things of this world. Things are fine. Things are good. I hope that you have all that you need and more and are blessed. Just don't let it distract you from what matters most. The material things that we accumulate in this world will someday be someone else's possession. But the things that we pay forward into eternity will always matter. Don't waste your life focused on building bigger barns. Invest your time and resources in building blessings in, in the lives of others. The history books are filled with the names of people who made a name for themselves, who accumulated great things. They conquered things. They ruled over things. They built power upon this earth. But if they didn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior... It's all for nothing. The final analysis is they were a fool. The Bible says that the only, it doesn't matter how many history books your name's recorded in, if your name's not in the book of life, 
you're the biggest fool of all. Today, if you're not confident your name's in that book, we're going to offer an invitation. And I'm going to ask that you would come and, and, and just speak with John and myself over here to, to the curtain to your right. Uh, there's no more important decision you can make today than to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord. Maybe you've gotten off track. Listen, this is a church where we believe there's no shame in saying, I'm off track. I'm not where I should be. The shame is not doing anything about it. We encourage, we call that rededicating yourself to get back up and get back where you need to be. We want to pray with you. We want to help you and guide you through getting back to the center of God's will. We can talk about that today if you want to come. Maybe you're carrying a burden. You just need to pray. You need someone to pray with you uh, over yourself or a need that you're carrying a burden for somebody else. We'd love to do that. Whatever's on your heart, won't you come as we stand and sing our song of invitation?